Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Hai Kadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say with hearts of gratitude, Hallelujah. Well, friends, today is March the 6th in the year of our Lord, 2018. And this is one a day for the soul. Now we're continuing our journey through the story of the Bible. And today we're going to talk about a judge <clears throat> by the name of Samson. Now this is going to begin in Judges chapter 13. So I encourage you to get your Bible so that you can follow along with us. Judges chapter 13 verse 1. And it says again, as we've talked about so many times before, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into oppression, into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. Now there was a certain man, he was of the family of the Danites. In other words, he was of the tribe of Dan, one of the 12 tribes of Israel, which means that he was under the law of God. This is going to be important. Now his name was Manoah, and his wife was barren, and she had not given children. The angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman, and said unto her, Behold, you are barren, and you do not bear children, but you will conceive and bear a son. Now therefore, beware, I pray you, and drink not wine, nor strong drink, and do not eat any unclean thing. For you will conceive and bear a son, but no razor shall come on his head, for he will be a Nazarite unto God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hands of the Philistines. Now, if you would, turn to chapter 14, and let's pick up the story of Samson. Now, of course, many years have passed, and Samson is a young man, strong in strength, it says Samson went down to Timnath. He saw a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Now you're going to learn that Samson's downfall was women. But the problem here is the woman that he has his eyes upon is from the Philistines, the pagan nation. And what his God told his people? Not to take women from the foreign nations. And Samson's father, Manoah, Samson himself being of the tribe of Dan, one of the 12 tribes of Israel, under the law of God, is breaking the very commandment of God by setting his desire upon this woman. Well, verse 2 says, Samson came and told his father and his mother. And he said, I've seen a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. So go get her to be my wife. Well, his father and his mother said unto him, Is there not a woman among the daughters of our brethren, among our people? Why must you take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines? But Samson, for the second time breaking a commandment, says unto his father, showing his father no respect, not honoring his father's wishes, simply says, Get her for me, for she pleases me. But in verse 4, very interesting. It says his father and mother knew not that it was of the Lord. It was by the Lord's design that he was setting Samson's heart upon this daughter of the Philistines to accomplish his perfect will over time. So what this is basically saying is that God had put it in the heart of Samson to do this thing to break the commandment of the Lord. Because God sought an occasion against the Philistines, for at that time, his people, the children of Israel, were under the dominion of the Philistines. Well, Samson and his father and mother, in verse 5, travel to Timnath, and they come to the vineyards, and a young lion roared against him. This young lion was confrontational to Samson, and it says, The Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon Samson. And Samson tore him as he would have tore a goat or a kid. In other words, this young lion was no match for the strength of Samson. Well, he told not his father or his mother what he had done. In verse 8 it says, 
after some time, Samson returned to take this young woman to be his bride. And he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. He wanted to see this trophy of his strength. But when he looked, there was a swarm of bees and honey in the carcass of the lion. Well, he took of the honey and he ate. And he gave his father and mother to eat of the honey. Well, it came to pass in verse 11 that when the people of Timnath saw Samson, they brought 30 companions to be with him. And Samson said unto them, I will put forth the riddle unto you, and if you can answer it, I will give you 30 sheets and 30 change of garments. But if you cannot answer it, then you will give me 30 sheets and 30 garments. And so they said unto him, put forth thy riddle. In verse 14, he proclaims the riddle. He says, out of the eater came forth meat, out of the strong came forth sweetness. But they could not within the three days expound the riddle. So it came to pass on the seventh day, they said unto Samson's wife, entice thy husband, that he may declare unto us the riddle. If you do not, we will burn down your father's house with you in it. Well, verse 16 says, Samson's wife wept before him. And she said unto Samson, why do you hate me? Why do you not love me? Why have you put forth the riddle unto the children of my people? Notice that. And yet you have not told me the answer. And he said, relax, wife. I have not even told it to my father or mother. Why should I tell it unto thee? But she wept before him for seven days while their feast lasted. And it came to pass on the seventh day that he finally told her because she lay sore upon him. And she immediately went and told the riddle to the children of her people. So her allegiance is to her people. Well, the men of the city said unto him on the seventh day, what is sweeter than honey? And what is stronger than a lion? Now, this is the answer to the riddle. If you look in verse 14, again, it says, out of the eater came forth meat. And so the answer is in verse 18, what is sweeter than honey? And the second part of the riddle is out of the strong came forth sweetness. Well, the answer to that is what is stronger than a lion? Now, Samson, realizing that they had answered his riddle, he says unto them, if you had not plowed with my heifer, in other words, if you had not messed with my wife, if you had not messed with my woman, you would have not discovered the riddle. And the spirit of the Lord Jehovah came upon him, and he went down to Ashkelon, and he killed 30 men. He took their spoils, and he gave the change of garments unto them, which expounded the riddle. So he said, if you answer the riddle, I'll give you 30 change of garments. Well, he took those 30 chains of garments from the 30 men, which he had just killed. Now in chapter 15, verse one, it says it came to pass within a while after in the time of the wheat harvest that Samson visited his wife with a kid. So he had left her in Timnath. He had traveled back home and now he comes to visit her and brings her a gift of a young goat. And he said to himself, I will go into my wife into the chamber. In other words, he's saying, I will go and sleep with my wife. But her father would not allow him to do so. For her father said in verse two, I thought that you utterly hated her. Therefore, I gave her to your friend. But here, here is her younger sister. And she is fairer, more beautiful than her older sister. Take her, the younger sister, I pray thee, instead of her older sister. And Samson said concerning them, I will be more blameless than I was in killing the Philistines when I set upon you. And so Samson went and caught 300 foxes. He tied them together by their tails and he put a firebrand in the middle between the two of them. When he had set the brands on fire, he let them go running through the cornfields of the Philistines and they burnt the cornfields, leaving nothing also the vineyards and olives. Then the Philistines said, who has done this? And they answered Samson because of his anger that his bride, his wife had been given to another. And so the Philistines came up and killed her and her father with fire. Well, this aroused Samson's anger within him. 
And in verse 8, it says, he smote them hip and thigh with a great slaughter. Now, because of this, and fearing the Philistines, 3,000 men of Judah went up to get Samson. And they told Samson that they would allow no harm to come to him if he would simply come down. So they bound him and they brought him down after he agreed to do so. Now it says in verse 14, when he came unto Lehi, the Philistines shouted against him. And the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon Samson. The cords that were upon his hand became as flax that were being burnt with fire, and he broke them easily. He found the jawbone of an ass, and he began to attack the Philistines. And he slew a thousand men with the jawbone of that ass. And so we see so far in the story that Samson was a vicious man, a man of much strength, incredible strength and a man who had the spirit of the Lord upon him that God was using for a specific purpose. And so the chapter ends by telling us that Samson judged Israel in the days of the Philistines 20 years. Well, in chapter 16, verse 1, it says, Samson went to Gaza, and there he saw a harlot, and he went in unto her. In other words, he went in and slept with her. After spending the night with her, in verse 4 it says, It came to pass afterward that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. Now you're probably beginning to see at this point, as I stated, that Samson's downfall was women, as it is with so many today. The numbers of those who consider themselves Christians, followers of the Lord Jesus, even clergy, those who are in pastoral positions, the numbers of those that are involved in pornography, fornication, adultery, and other promiscuous sexual relationships is staggering, friends. And yet this was Samson's downfall. Well, it continues in verse 5, and it says, The lords of the Philistine came to Delilah, and they said unto her, Entice him, and see where his great strength comes from, so that we can prevail against him, and put an end to all this mayhem. And if you do so, we'll give you 1,100 pieces of silver, which today's value would be around $140,000. But 4,000 years ago, 2,500 years ago, whatever it may be, you can imagine how great an amount of money that was. And so Delilah accepts the bribe. She says to Samson, tell me, I pray thee, I beg you, where does your strength lie? And Samson said unto her in verse 7, If you bind me with seven green wisps that were never dried, then I will be weak. Well, Delilah, testing this theory, binds Samson with these seven green wisps. And after he is asleep, she awakens him with the scream that the Philistines are coming to attack him. And as he jumps up, he easily breaks the binds. And in verse 10, Delilah said unto Samson, you have mocked me. You've told me lies. Tell me, I pray thee, where does your strength lie? And so he said unto her in verse 11, If you bind me with new ropes that were never occupied by another, then I will be weak. Well, Delilah does the same thing for a second time. And at the end of verse 12, Samson jumps up and he breaks these binds from off his arms like they were simply threads. Again, Delilah says unto him, you've mocked me, you've lied to me. Please tell me where you get your strength from. And he said unto her, if you weave the seven locks of my head like a web, then I will lose my strength. So again, she tests him. And again, he jumps to his feet, showing great force of strength and preparing himself for battle. Well, in verse 15, again, she says, how can you say you love me when you're not telling me all the truth? You have mocked me three times by not telling me where your strength comes from. And notice verse 16, it says, It came to pass when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him so that his soul was vexed unto death. In other words, she set in on nagging him without any letting up and bringing him great discomfort and annoyance. Now, this is interesting because in Proverbs chapter 27, verse 15, it says a continual dropping in a very rainy day and a contentious woman are alike. In a modern translation, it says it like this. 
A nagging woman is like a dripping faucet. And we all know how annoying a dripping faucet can be. And so back to our text in verse 16, Delilah pressed Samson daily with her words. She nagged him so that his soul was vexed unto death. And so he relented, he gave in, he told her all his heart. And he said unto her, there's never a razor that has come upon my head. I've been a Nazarite unto God since I was a baby. If you shave my head, then my strength will go from me and I will become weak like any other man. Well, when Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she called the Philistines, and after receiving the money that they had promised to her, she made him go to sleep upon her knees. She shaved his head, and she woke him by saying, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. When he awoke out of his sleep, he said, I will go out as at other times before, and I will shake myself. Yet he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. And so not being able to defend himself, in verse 21, the Philistines took him. They put out his eyes. They brought him down to Gaza. They bound him with fetters of brass. They didn't take any chances. They didn't tie him with ropes. They bound him with brass, and they put him in the prison house, working the grinding wheel. However, after being there for some time, his hair began to grow again. Well, once your hair is shaved bald, to grow back to any significant length takes months, possibly four, five, six months, a, even a year. We don't know how long his hair grew back to, how long it needed to grow back to. But after this period of time, it says in verse 23, the lords of the Philistines gathered together to offer a great sacrifice unto Dagon their God and to rejoice or to party. And so obviously drunkenness is a priority within this party. And they said unto themselves, Our God Dagon has delivered Samson into our hands. And when the people saw Samson, they praised their God Dagon. For they said, Our God Dagon has delivered into our hands our enemy. And it came to pass in verse 25, when their hearts were merry, they said, Call for Samson, so that we can make sport of him. We're all drunk. We're having a good time. We need some entertainment. Bring Samson forth and let us begin to mock him and make sport of him so that we may entertain ourselves. And so after bringing Samson out of the prison house, they placed him between the two great pillars that supported the home or the palace or, or the building that they were in. Well, Samson, being both blind and defenseless, said unto the lad that held him by his hand, Suffer me that I may fill the pillars whereupon the house stands, that I may lean upon these pillars. Now the house in which they were in at the time was full of men and women, and all the lords, the leaders of the Philistines were there. Upon the roof alone there were 3,000 men and women, not counting who was in the lower floor. And they had positioned themselves on the roof so that they could better view those below who were making sport of Samson. And so Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me, I pray thee, only this once, O God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars upon which the house stood the one with his right hand and the other with his left. And Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed with all his might. And he began to push upon those pillars. And the house fell upon the Lord's and upon all the people that were therein. So the dead which Samson slew at his death were more than they which he slew in his life. And the chapter ends by telling us that Samson judged Israel for 20 years. Now, as fascinating as this story is, and as many truths as we can draw out of this story, what I want to focus upon today is the influence that other people have upon us. When God called the prophets to do his work and to speak against the house of Israel and the house of Judah, who had given themselves unto serving the gods of the pagan nations, 
It's very interesting because God says, do not be afraid of them. But he emphasizes, do not be afraid of the look on their faces. And oftentimes, people can influence us. They can intimidate us more so by the look on their faces than by the words that they speak unto us. And so God is telling his prophets, you look beyond these intimidating faces and you see them for the weak creatures that they are when compared to my glory, because I am going to go before you and I will allow no harm to come unto you. And yet when in the midst of that intimidation, in the midst of such a show of force, those words are easier said than obeyed. And so it is, friends, many times in our lives, when we know what we are to do, according to what God has told us in his word, yet we become intimidated. We allow ourselves to be intimidated by others, and we don't take a stand for God. We fold under the pressure, just as Samson folded under the pressure of Delilah as she continually set up on him and vexed his soul day after day. And as I am thinking of many examples of how this takes place in our lives, regardless of the individual particulars for each of us, there's two things that we must remember. There's two ways that we can avoid this. We can either hope in the strength of the Lord and ask for the strength of the Lord so that we will be faithful to what God has called us to do, or we can make sure that we're not in that situation to begin with. Like the old saying says, if you can't take the heat, stay out of the kitchen. Now, this may mean that you have to sever some relationships in order to remain faithful to God and what he's called you to do. But are you going to allow your friends, your family to come between your relationship with God? Or are you going to remain true to God, stand on the side of God, and be faithful to him in all things and at all times? Will you stand for God when the whole world, all of your friends, all of your families, all that you know is against you? Friends, sometimes that's the way it's going to feel, and sometimes that is the choice we have to make. And so it is my prayer that your relationship with the Lord Jesus will be so rich, will be so deeply rooted, that you'll remain true to him no matter the opposition. Well, I love you, friends. I'm so thankful again that you're with us. I pray the Lord Jesus will bless your day today. I pray that as you focus upon him and his kingdom, that you will be filled with heavenly joy. And as you read and study his word, ponder and meditate upon the things that you've read, that your eyes will be enlightened and that you'll be challenged in new ways to be more faithful in your commitment, your dedication, and your allegiance unto your king, King Jesus. Now, as he wills, and until next time, friends, I truly love you. I'll see you on the next video.